Okay, great. I, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome to everybody who's joining us right now. Welcome to our panelists. Uh, thank you all for being here and for continuing the conversation on what we've learned and what's next in COVID policies. Um, I'm delighted to have a panel of experts today and, and people really um, highly committed to informing evidence-based policies that improve health and well-being and the economy during the pandemic uh, in the first phase and, and as we look ahead. I, so uh, with that, I will turn over to our, um, our discussion. I'll be presenting for the first uh, 15 minutes. Uh, then we'll have I, our um, other panelists present. We'll ask a couple of questions. Please do feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and, um, and then at the end, we'll all come back together for a panel discussion. Uh, so my co-panelists could turn off their cameras while I'm presenting this introduction, and then we'll turn over to you um, after that. Hi. So this um, discussion is really a culmination of um, the first few years of pandemic policies and the work that we've done on the COVID-19 U.S. state policy database in the, in the first phase of that work. And the COVID-19 U.S. state policy database compiles more than 200 policies on state policies to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to reduce economic hardship uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and so that will be, those will be the policies that we talk about today. The COVID-19 U.S. state policy database premise of our work was that COVID brings joint health and economic disasters. And in a context of structural racism and structural inequities in the United States, disasters make disparities worse. Policy actions during disasters can reduce or exacerbate, exacerbate disparities, and federal leadership is key. Federal, only the federal government has the um, funding, the coordinating capacity, and the pulpit to really lead a comprehensive response. And there was a need for research to inform policies at a rapid pace as the pandemic hit, and we needed um, imminent uh, work to reduce the spread of COVID and to reduce the harms of, of um, all of the unemployment that um, that the pandemic caused. Uh, and then disasters can be an opportunity to change structural inequities or inform them in the future. We have unprecedented data collection during the COVID-19 pandemic, not just on policies, but on the spread of disease, on economic hardship, on people's day-to-day, um, -day, week week-to-week lives um, that we've never had before. And so we have enduring challenges and disparities uh, like food insufficiency and food insecurity in the United States and housing insecurity. Um, and this is really an unprecedented period for being able to, um, to see how different policies affect different people um, and what happens when we are able to avert those harms. Um, and how policies can play a role. So some of the examples are learning about unemployment insurance, minimum wage, and paid sick leave. Uh, just to speak to how um, prior disasters and diseases have exacerbated disparities in our structurally unequal context, we've seen this with natural disasters and climate disasters um, like hurricanes. We've seen this with the Great Recession, and we've seen this with HIV, um, that there are, there are enormous disparities. And these um, disparities happen with COVID-19 as well, and they are continuing to, um, there are continue to be large racial and ethnic disparities in the burden of COVID-19. This figure depicts um, the total number of deaths um, per population for by race and ethnicity throughout the pandemic in red, um, and it, it, since the beginning of 2022 in orange, um, beginning of 2022 through October. Um, and you can see that, um, that there really continue to be large disparities. Native American um, and Native Hawaiian people are about, um, and Pacific Islander people are about twice as likely as white or Asian people, more than twice as likely as white or Asian people um, to have died. Um, and um, Hispanic and black people are about 50% more likely to have died relative to white and Asian people just in the past year. Uh, and these are age group specific data based on Mary Bassett's seminal work in FOSS medicine, um, highlighting the importance of age group specific data, not just age adjusted data, because the white population tends to be older because of these structural inequities also play out with other diseases. Um, these disparities are not inevitable. Um, we, we see that the COVID-19 pandemic hit in a structural context that was highly unequal, driven by historical and modern day policies like slavery, like redlining, like a low federal minimum wage. 
Um, and so before the pandemic ever hit in 2019, the household income of white people in the United States was about eight times that of black people and about six times that of Latinx or Hispanic people. And these were the only categories presented in this particular report. Um, so as we talk about where we've been and where we're going, we'll talk about two intertwined policy stories, the economy and public health. Uh, and there are some high points and some low points and a lot to do in the days ahead. So with the economy, um, how it started and how it's going, um, you know, I, th I think this is a really remarkable story, um, you know, just how unequal the COVID-19 pandemic unemployment was. Um, here we have this figure from the Washington Post on um, unemployment during prior recessions and how people um, in different income groups were affected. Um, and here you can see that during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there's a much larger effect overall, but that really we see um, this dramatic effect for the lowest in uh, earning households um, and it's slow to recover. So there's, there's really not been any recession like it. Um, uh, this was the most extreme. And, um, and it called for a, a, a comprehensive policy response. Um, and, you know, and I think that journalism like this really helped inform that. And that's what we saw. Um, so now, um, where, where are we in 2022? Well, in 2022, most of the policies have expired. But what happened in 2021 when they were in place was that poverty fell to record lows, um, that child poverty fell to record lows. And we saw that the policy response really did, um, did have an impact on reducing economic hardship. How did we get there? You know, how did we get from record unemployment to record drops in child poverty? It was this comprehensive policy response through economic stimulus bills with stimulus checks, um, federal expansion of unemployment insurance coverage, um, uh, duration and amount, um, SNAP benefit increases, the expanded child tax credit, and more to really help um, make sure that people avoided the worst of economic hardship. But also, how did we get there, right? Like, how do we end up with this really comprehensive policy response? And, you know, I, I hope that people in public health are listening closely because this was more than a decade of, of um, really comprehensive, rigorous research that informed a better response during the COVID recession than during the Great Recession. Um, so there was all this research on, um, on how the, the policy response to the Great Recession was not sufficient, um, especially to address disparities and address those with the lowest wealth. Um, and it wasn't just um, uh, the research. It was also that um, there were many voices from, um, from many perspectives speaking to the need for a strong policy response. So there were people from think tanks and experts, um, you know, and there were also people really going out there and saying, you know, we actually, um, we, there are some people who are saying we don't need a comprehensive response and they, um, they thought the same during the Great Recession and that wasn't enough. Um, and, I, you know, I think it was really important for a range of voices to um, to communicate this in a range of ways. And it's not easy, um, but it was important and it did achieve um, the goals of reducing economic hardship at a, at a critical time. Voices are more powerful and more protected when they are, speak together. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of the work we have to do is to work together to develop the most rigorous evidence, to work together to, um, to consider trade-offs from different perspectives and to work together to really communicate um, as a field um, and also not let any one um, strong perspective dominate, but to, you know, to really undertake this project and this reflection in public health. All right, so public health, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, how it started was that um, hospitals were overflowing in New York City um, and, um, you know, they were um, uh, shutting down. They were using refrigerator trucks um, to store bodies. Um, you know, it was really overwhelming the city and we didn't know what the virus was, how it spread. We thought it might be on the mail. Um, and so, um, there were closures while people stayed home. And, you know, the sounds filling New York City were those of ambulances um, and they were running out of ambulances. OK, how is it going? <laughs> well, we've run out of ambulances several times. Um, 
since then, um, and we are running out of pediatric hospital capacity, not just due to COVID-19, due to other viruses as well, the, due to flu and RSV, because COVID is part of this ecosystem um, and the mitigation measures that we took, um, part of this ecosystem um, that could, that, um, you know, where the virus could make people more vulnerable to other diseases, um, where there might be more population spread of diseases that haven't had a lot of spread in the in prior two years because um, of respiratory protections. The U.S. has the most deaths, um, the highest death rate of high income countries. Um, so, you know, I think as we're having these rational policy discussions, are we doing too little or doing too much? It's really important to anchor ourselves in the big picture context. Um, and, and the big picture context is that we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, and I think we have um, we have come a long way since um, we did think that COVID might spread on the mail or, you know, or on the or on playground equipment. Um, and how long it, it took to you know, inform the most rational policies, um, you know, is part of the reflection that we have to do. But I also think it happened in a context of politics and power um, and, feder and, um, and federal leadership that wasn't particularly aligned with speaking to the evidence. So it's very hard um, to communicate what we should and shouldn't do using um, all of the capacity of the federal government when, um, when we have federal leaders who are not necessarily speaking to the evidence. Um, and just to give you some context, um, you know, I, I think we should really be talking about much more than um, business closures and lockdowns at this point, because that was really something that we did at the beginning of the pandemic while we learned more about how the virus spread. And most of those um, did end early in the pandemic once we did learn how it spread. Um, but we've had a, a lot of deaths um, uh, since that period. Um, uh, with more than a million deaths in the United States, uh, you know, just for some context, um, prior to working on COVID, I worked on HIV. Um, the federal government devoted 10% um, of the NIH budget to HIV, which causes about 40,000 new infections a year. Um, and we were working to reduce those. And in uh, several periods of the COVID pandemic, we've seen more than 40,000 deaths a month. Um, in addition to all of the hospitalizations and long COVID. It's a very high burden of infectious disease. Uh, uh, COVID was also the number one leading cause of death for people aged 45 to 54 in 2021. Um, these are many of the essential workers um, who got us through the pandemic um, in the early period. Um, and uh, you know, and I, th I think um, we have to remember that those the graphs that we look at are made up of people. Um, and when you read the stories of these people in the article, you know, most of them leave behind families. All of them leave behind um, students and communities who care about them. Um, and we really have to face um, the you know the enormity of this loss um, uh, in order to uh, most comprehensively address. Um, the COVID, the challenges of the COVID pandemic and other challenges that we as a society face going forward. Okay, so how did we get to the point where the United States has so many COVID deaths? Um, you know, we, we had this really fantastic learning about how to reduce um, the spread of COVID. And we learned um, about vaccines, masks, ventilation, testing and isolation, treatment, and data um, to help inform our response. Um, and these are the layers of mitigation often presented as Swiss cheese. <laughs> um, I, and, um, and they remain the layers that, that are effective. What we learned in as early as, as May, 2020, um, much of that remains true. And it took us time to learn you know, how much of it um, was spread through something like fomites. And what we've really learned is it's, it's, um, it's airborne um, and that's how we should focus on reducing transmission. But what we've ended up having happen is that um, we don't have enough people vaccinated. We have very little mask wearing at this point. We have very little ventilation. Most schools, three quarters of Boston schools don't have HVAC systems. Um, testing and isolation um, has been um, eroded. There's um, very little PCR testing, often no longer free. Um, uh, the rapid tests are expensive um, and imperfect. Um, uh, many people haven't had access to treatment um, and timely treatment uh, and hospital capacity may not be there when they need it. Uh, and um, we've had data eroded. We don't have data um, to look by vaccination status or by vaccination status and race and ethnicity or vaccination status, race and ethnicity and age group, which is ideally what we would have at this point. 
to be able to inform a comprehensive response and, and um, learn and do better. Um, these policies or, or these interventions, these layers of mitigation, um, we, can trans, we can scale them up um, and we can make them more effective um, by, um, through policies. Um, and at this point, we have we added more and more and more and more to this list as we went on um, all of these different ways that we could implement policies to mitigate COVID transmission um, without um, having the really high costs of stay at home orders or school closures um, or broad business closures. Right. Like there are several options here. Um, and some of them are, you know, doing some good things in addition to um, in, in addition to doing um, policies that are harder to implement, like creating outdoor spaces um, for people to gather and spend time um, not necessarily needing to wear masks. Um, and I, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do to find some middle ground on this, um, because with no policies, um, we do end up facing really high costs. It's not um, it's not a, a, um, a happy situation. It's a situation where we have um, higher rates of deaths. Um, and how, how did we end up with no policies? How did we end up with so much erosion um, of our layered mitigation? Um, there was a lot of money behind it. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of organizing against having workplace safety standards in hospitals. There were other groups that were intent on disrupting public education. And a good way to disrupt public education was to make masks in schools a hot button issue a divisive issue um, and when to um, to um, rail against unions, rail against um, I, school boards, um, rail against evidence based implementation, um, you know, and really, really bring out extremes um, in ways that are also happening in other domains uh, with human rights uh, for people who are LGBTQ uh, with um, critical race theory um, and accurate um, depictions of history. So, you know, I think we should recognize this is the context we're in, this is what's happening. You know, they're sending people to um, to make the same noise outside policymakers' homes, um, or even worse, uh, they're sending people to our hospitals um, uh, to protest the very workers who are carrying everyone through the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, we also see that, um, I, that, that there are people who are well-intentioned, who want to prevent pandemics, um, who, are pouring money into um, into domains that may not be very constructive, um, and so you know I think we um, we have to recognize that this is a strategy, and and that it you know when we're weighing costs and benefits, and we think we're having this rational conversation, there are some really big feet on the scale, <laughs> um, trying to tip that conversation, um, and and trying to disrupt societal cohesion. And power and politics may align. Pandemics are very unpopular. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, there was um, Biden's approval readings were not high. Um, we had um, really high transmission during Delta and Omicron, um, and I, and you know, it's it's um, no one wants to live in a pandemic. It's much harder. <laughs> it's much costlier, um, and it can be politically strategic to downplay um, a pandemic. Um, Ronald Reagan didn't mention HIV um, in his his first term in office, and he won re-election by a large margin. Uh, but, you know, I think we saw that turnaround being one of the most monumental achievements in public health. Um, here, Dr. Fauci wrote um, I, in 2019, I believe, about um, PEPFAR and um, what a historic achievement it was, how much, uh, I, how much lower um, uh, deaths had become because of distributing ART around the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope that gives us hope that there's room for improvement. Um, I will also say that policymakers can do both, that most of the policymakers, there were only a few who implemented mask policies during the Delta and Omicron surges, but most of those state policymakers who did were reelected. Uh, and so, um, you know, I don't think we should think of this as a zero sum game. You can mitigate harms and, um, and you can um, continue that work. Um, you can make the case. I, for why you should remain in office. We have seen that federal messaging and guidance was a very large driver of policies and behaviors. Um, so um, on May 13th, 2021, this is a depiction of mask wearing data um, collected by IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Um, and you can see that the largest decline um, in mask wearing happened around the time that the CDC um, 
uh, communicated the end of mask policy guidance, end of universal masking guidance. Um, and it had started to decline, you know, COVID had started to decline, several states had started to roll back their policies, but this was really a tipping point for most states doing that. And then even when we had these very deadly Delta and Omicron surges, 350,000 people dying in seven months, we don't see that mask wearing goes back up or is universal in this um, in the way that is most effective after that. Similarly, um, you know, with vaccination rates, um, this is very flat, uh, you know, in, in the recent months, um, and especially since the July 4th period in 2021, when, um, when the administration started to declare, you know, sort of a return to normal in the end of the pandemic. And of course, you know, just after that, we did see these very deadly surges, but we did not see the same kind of comprehensive policy response. So what's next? Um, hopefully finding a healthier middle ground. Um, strengthening and investing in institutions and institutional leadership, um, recognizing that it's in an increasingly charged context of politics and power. Like um, there are, the United States faces a question broadly of how do we strengthen our democracy um, and the institutions that uh, make up our federal government and their leaders um, are really core to that. Um, achieving a better, more evidence-based balance now and next time. Um, so now in the current pandemic, you know, and providing um, you know, some middle ground so that we can have some spaces where there's not really high transmission or some periods when we have new variants, when we do work to mitigate transmission, um, and we continue the work to vaccinate people and reduce really large inequities in vaccination and boosting that continue. Um, and as I say, maybe sooner than we wish, you know, I was really worried in the spring of 2021 that we might see a really bad variant in a few years. And we saw a really bad variant in a couple of months and then another one, um, another couple of months. So, you know, I think we should be prepared. Um, and there's a lot that we can do. It's that's sort of in an in-between space. Um, evidence can inform policies in a context of power and politics. Politics ultimately are people. Um, and each of us is part of this system. We have power. Um, we are people. Um, we have the capacity to inform the people around us, uh, to influence the people around us. Um, you know, and every person who um, so suggests an approach of community protection and caring and supporting one another in our society through this does make a difference um, and speaking to the evidence on how to do so. I this work has really been possible, um, you know, and, and the um, review I just provided and a lot of the learning, like, um, I'm really um, just so grateful for the, the um, what our um, COVID-19 U.S. state policy database community contributed um, and that so many contributed. We developed the COVID-19 U.S. state policy database based on our prior work on policies and knowing that recording the dates would be important. It ended up being really important to record it in real time because, um, you know, the government websites that we have screenshots of, you know, would, um, would totally transform in the coming months. And so um, I, you know, we now recognize we wouldn't have been able to do this unless we did it in real time. And that took a lot of people. It was also inspired by many others who similarly were sharing um, their work publicly and, and coming together collectively in our response. Um, the Johns Hopkins team that shared the COVID-19 um, case and death data um, and, um, and the vaccine researchers who were sharing their, their data. You know, I hope that's a model um, for what we can achieve in science um, and in the world when we do take a collective response. So what some of the achievements from the COVID-19 database were tracking um, 200 uh, policy variables, um, over 160 publications, most of which were really in that initial period when we needed to inform the response, some of which you'll hear about today. Um, facilitating the first um, uh, study on state mask policies uh, in health affairs, a policy that was ultimately implemented in 40 states and DC. Um, facilitating research that informed the American Rescue Plan um, and the CDC eviction moratorium um, and the Biden January 2021 pandemic plan, which was a very good plan and I hope we can um, still work to implement now. Um, thank you to our CUSP team. You can see it took a lot of people um, uh, to do this work um, and everyone really contributed immensely and um, shared a motivation to try to help um, in, in difficult times. Um, and I'm especially grateful to the students um, who helped compile 
um, the CUSP database and who helped compile the housing data um, with the eviction lab and Emily Benfer's work. Um, and, um, you know, and really wouldn't have been able to, to do this without so many people working to contribute. Um, so I, I put, uh, for, the, for next, um, I put several um, policies um, that we need more research on, several policy questions that we need more research on. I, I hope this is the work we can do over the next decade um, and, um, and more immediately to inform better um, now and going forward. Um, so how can policies jointly maximize health and the economy? What can we learn about automatic stabilizers when things start to get really bad with health or really bad with the economy to keep people from experiencing the worst? Um, what are um, some of the structural challenges of, of paid sick leave, childcare, and unemployment insurance that remain relevant? What can we learn about them? Um, how do we weigh trade-offs? What costs, when, for how long, and to whom? You know, it's, um, how high are the societal costs? And so often we, you know, are, are told to think about our individual costs. You know, what is the cost to me of wearing a mask? What is the cost to me of getting a booster? Um, and, you know, I, I think that we should think of these as societal challenges. Um, you know, and I think similarly like businesses, what is the cost to me of paying for N95s? Um, what is the cost to me of paying for paid sick leave, of providing isolation until someone tests negative? Um, I, and... Um, you know, I think we should think of these as societal costs um, and community costs, where if you have an employee come back while they're still testing negative, then you may have all of your other employees out sick. Um, and if you have a child come back um, before they um, are testing negative, you may have a whole classroom without a teacher and, and with several other kids who are sick and who, some of whom um, are likely to have a family member experience something severe. Um, so how do we think about these questions? How do we weigh them? And how do we uh, um, acknowledge that they're really heterogeneous, that people who are wealthy and white um, I have and privileged and high socioeconomic status have experienced a very different pandemic? Um, and, um, and how do we come together to think about the shared society in which we want to live and policies to support that? We tried to capture some of this in a recent New England Journal of Medicine editorial um, suggesting the COVID pandemic will not be without continuing costs, a pre-pandemic normal not attainable in the short term, no matter how urgently we desire it. And the questions for policymakers are these, are how high will we allow the societal costs to be and who will bear the greatest costs? Um, you know, we see our healthcare workers um, uh, working beyond their capacity in pediatric hospitals, um, beyond their capacity throughout the pandemic. Um, we see the essential workers who've borne the brunt of repeated COVID infections and kids in schools and their teachers who now bear very high risk. Um, and how we come together as a society to think about how we reduce those societal costs and the inequities of them. And most importantly, I hope, um, I hope everyone will speak to the evidence to equity and inclusion um, and, um, and to the, how we can um, uh, inform a better response going forward. Thank you to our contributors, our panelists, um, our funders, and everyone working on public health and COVID, especially in times that are harder. Um, I will stop sharing and go to Q&A and then turn over to our panelists. Um, all right, so, um, so the first question we have is, the question is how to maximize health over the economy as capitalism will always maximize profit which comes from paying less wages and benefits than value of product. Um, can you ever guarantee health as a priority without changing the economic system? <laughs> well, um, I don't think we can make any guarantees, but I think we can make a really strong case for how we might um, I, how we might maximize both. Um, and so, you know, I think we can make a case that um, that healthcare systems that oppose workplace safety standards um, rely on workers and are also suffering very high costs from not having enough workers right now. Um, and so, you know, I think thinking about how can we implement workplace safety standards um, that are um, that are, are reasonable um, and that also protect those workers and protect the population more broadly so that those healthcare workers aren't overwhelmed, that's actually mutually beneficial to um, everyone in our shared society, to the patients, the providers, and their employers. Um, and I think so much of the thinking has been on what is the up upfront cost of paying for masks or taking on workplace safety standards 
Um, and I think that, you know, we need to have a more um, upfront participatory conversation about, you know, how do we really ask these hard questions um, and um, come up with a better approach because this is a vicious cycle. People who are working in hospitals are, um, are overwhelmed, um, working in really difficult short staffed conditions. And they might very reasonably not want to keep doing that when they have the capacity to do all manner of things. Uh, they might quit. And then the next time this happens, or just um, as, it, as this continues to happen sort of perpetually, um, there are even more short staff. The working conditions are even harder. The staff who are there are even less um, familiar with that health system. Um, and this is a vicious cycle. And we have to think about how do we enter a virtuous cycle? How do we come together around some more reasonable middle ground policies uh, that help support everyone? Um, thank you. Great question, Ellen. Uh, what are the most effective, tangible, and specific things those not in public health can do to support your work and the adoption of better policies across all levels? Thanks so much for your question. You know, I think um, I think that I, one thing that is really good about the you know the pandemic, um, I and um, and the experience during it is that everyone should feel empowered to help. Um, and I, you know, and I, I and should know that there are things that you can do. So you can post. Um, information about what's happening with the pandemic in your social media sites um, and different ones that reach different audiences um, and just let people know, you know, what's happening, what can they do? You know, many people uh, may not know that they should be getting a booster, even if they're under 65, right? Like, let them know, um, you know, it should be a bad winter. Um, there are holidays coming up. There's going to be a lot of transmission, most likely. That's what we've seen in prior years. Um, and that's what happens when a lot of people mix with respiratory viruses circulating. So get those flu vaccines and COVID boosters today, <laughs> you know, set up those appointments, um, you know, wear masks on transit and on airplanes, um, you know, post your story of where you're wearing a mask. You can wear it to protect yourself. So you have a nice Thanksgiving and you can wear it to protect the babies on the plane around you um, who are too young to wear masks. Um, you know, as pediatric hospitals are overwhelmed, you know, I think, um, I think we shouldn't underestimate the value of these. And I look forward to more discussion of this um, with Sarah Horsley, who will present on activism and getting involved in your community and, and coordinating and working together, and really making that most impactful. All right, so I will turn over to um, Tate Lifehite to speak to some of the work on housing policies next. Um, and then uh, come back to the other excellent questions uh, during the Q&A at the end. All right, thank you so much, Julia. Let me share my slides. Uh, you seeing the slides or preventer, presenter view? Yes, we see slides. Excellent. All right, so thank you so much for having me and for organizing uh, this panel. Also, thank you to everybody who collected the CUSP data. It's been such a valuable resource for me and, and for the public health research community as well. Um, so today I'm gonna speak about some of the work we did about housing policies during the pandemic and specifically eviction moratoriums as they relate to COVID-19 incidents and mortality. I wanted to start by acknowledging my co-authors, Fred Zimmerman, Julia Raifman, Craig Pollock, Sabria Linton, Gabe Schwartz, and Emily Bemfer, and also my funding from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, so this is a, a graph that's familiar to all of us, not only because we lived it, but because it was in Dr. Raifman's slide deck. So as businesses were shuttered in, in summer of 2020, uh, spring and summer of 2020, uh, workers and especially server service workers um, face staggering levels of job loss and low-income households and people of color were disproportionately affected. And at the time, sheltering in place was perhaps our best tool to prevent surges in COVID-19 cases and deaths. But workers affected by job loss were struggling to make rent and they were worried that they might be evicted. So there's a tension here, right? You can't shelter in place if you don't have shelter. And widespread evictions would be devastating to families and they could also make the pandemic worse. So first and most dramatically, evictions lead to homelessness. As you can see from this photo from Southern California, shelters are not equipped to allow for social distancing. 
Um, more commonly, evictions lead households to double up, which means moving in with your friends or families. Um, doubling up also increases household crowding and, and, your, and decreases your ability to control your exposure to COVID-19. And finally, the threat of evictions could force people to take on work with high levels of COVID exposures. So to prevent mass evictions and the spread of COVID-19, 43 states and the District of Columbia enacted eviction moratoriums in spring of 2020. But the policies faced immediate pushback. So as spring and summer wore on, states started to end their moratoriums. The median state eviction moratorium only lasted 10 weeks. By the time the CDC issued a federal moratorium blocking evictions in September of 2020, only 17 states still had effective moratoriums. Those are the states in dark purple on this map. The light purple are states that allowed their moratoriums to expire, and the gray are states that never had a moratorium. So as these states began to roll back their moratoriums, there's a real fear that rates of COVID would increase. And our paper here, published in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 2021, asks the question, what happened? So we exploit the variation in timing of eviction moratorium expiration to understand how eviction moratoriums and more broadly evictions and housing instability are related to the spread of COVID-19. Just some quick notes on our study design. Um, so we study US states that ever had an eviction moratorium. Our exposure here is the time since a state's eviction moratorium expired. Our outcomes are confirmed COVID-19 cases and deaths. This is from the Johns Hopkins database. And I should say the exposure comes from the CUSP database. And then we also include a number of time varying controls. So because there's this concern that eviction moratoriums expiring would happen at the same time that other public health orders were being rolled back, uh, we control for things like testing rates and interventions such as stay at home orders, school closures and mask mandates. We include fixed effects for time in state that allows us to control for kind of the underlying time invariant characteristics of a state, for example, the political climate as well as overarching national trends in COVID. And we uh, conduct negative binomial regression with the population offset. So this is one of our main results figures and I'll spend a minute walking through it. On the y-axis, the vertical axis is the incidence rate ratio. And that is a number that compares the, the rate of COVID incidence, so new cases, in a state that allowed its eviction moratorium to expire to the rate in a state that kept their moratorium in place. And moving across the horizontal x-axis is time. So time since the eviction moratorium lifted. Time zero is the moment that the moratorium expired. And it's important with these kind of graphs to look before time zero and check that incidence in the states that went on to, to lift their moratoriums was not increasing before the moratorium expired. That might suggest that there was a pre-existing trend, incidence was gonna go up anyways in these states, um, but you'll see that that's not the case. So before time zero, we see a pretty flat trend suggesting uh, that there is some sort of causal effect here. And after time zero, we see this precipitous uptick, uptick in COVID incidence in the states that allowed their eviction moratoriums to expire to the point that 16 weeks after the moratoria expired, we're seeing almost twice, over twice the incidence of COVID in the states with expired moratoria. And then we do the same analysis for COVID mortality, and we see a really similar pattern. So a flat trend before the moment of expiration, and then a really steep, this time even steeper increase in mortality associated with the expiration of the moratorium. So here at 16 weeks, we're seeing over five times the mortality in states that allowed their eviction moratoria to expire relative to those that kept them in place. So based on these data, we conclude that the expiration of state eviction moratoriums was associated with increased COVID-19 cases and deaths. Some limitations to bear in mind, we're not accounting for local eviction moratoriums or public health interventions. So this is purely a state level analysis. And in a lot of cases, there were local measures that blocked eviction moratoriums, even if a state didn't have an order in place. 
There's also the potential for unmeasured confounding in this type of analysis. So in other words, if a state uh, or if, if all states were consistently implementing some sort of policy that affects COVID cases or deaths at the exact same moment that they were allowing these moratoriums to expire, we could be picking up the, the effects of that intervention instead of evictions. As I said earlier, we controlled for a number of measures and we feel pretty confident that we were able to, to get as close as possible to isolating the effects of eviction moratoriums. In terms of policy relevance, our results were cited to extend and defend CDC's federal eviction moratorium until it was ultimately struck down by the US Supreme Court in August of 2021. This extension bought time for governments to distribute emergency rental assistance and hopefully keep people in their homes. The bigger picture here though, is that unaffordable housing and housing insecurity are threats to pandemic preparedness, population health, and health equity. So as we talk about planning for the next emergency, we need to acknowledge that the housing affordability crisis creates precarity. So half of renters spend over 30% of their incomes on rent, and one in four spends over 50% of their income in rent. In this context, any unexpected expense or loss of income can lead to late rent and risk of eviction. And in the context of this crisis, any event that leads to mass job loss can quickly exacerbate the housing crisis. So as we saw here, widespread housing insecurity can fuel a public health emergency and concentrate the harms of that emergency among structurally disadvantaged communities. So we're seeing this cyclicality between an economic crisis, a, public, a housing crisis, and a health crisis. Um, and you might say that's a lot of crises, and you'd be right. Um, and the fact that these are feeding each other is a major problem for our nation's health, our economic security, and our social well-being. Um, so the question we should be asking is, what can we do to get rid of some of these arrows? And in particular, let's start with this one. Moratoriums were one fairly effective way to make it so that a short-term economic shock didn't create mass homelessness. But moratoriums were a stopgap measure and faced extreme pushback from landlords and developers. So unfortunately, I don't think we're likely to see another massive federal eviction moratorium. And the more sustainable solution is to get renters out of their precarious housing situation. So to look upstream and address the housing crisis. Um, as we plan for the next emergency, robust, rapidly deployed and equitably distributed income supports. So things like the child tax credit, expanded unemployment, as well as rental assistance, these are vital. Um, so when people have a shortfall of income, we need to work to supplement them so they can still make rent and, and buy other necessities. But that being said, those sorts of, of income supports might prove insufficient if we don't rein in housing costs. So housing costs have really run away in recent years and income has not kept pace. Um, so we, we really have to address housing costs if we're gonna fix this problem. So some potential policy solutions to that point, um, first and foremost, we need to increase the housing supply. There's just not enough housing in most major cities in the US to house people. And so the mismatch of supply and demand creates high rents. Um, I don't only mean private housing, but also public housing. Um, we can stabilize rents through things like uh, rent control, and then we can defend and expand tenant rights so that tenants are able to organize and advocate for themselves. And with that, I'd like to thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Kate. Really fantastic uh, presentation. Um, uh, and such a pleasure to, uh, to to get to see your overview of, of everything that has happened <laughs> um, in the housing space more recently. Um, what do you think we can learn from the COVID-19 period about, um, about policies that can help people stay in their homes during future crises, whether those are climate crises or future recessions, um, and about the importance of that, not just for 
um, for the individuals who need to stay in their homes, but for communities that want to face less homelessness and also for those developers who want their um, property values to remain high. Yeah, so I, I think it's important to acknowledge that the housing crisis means that we're we're all living in a house of cards um, and any kind of mass crisis, be it public health, environmental, economic, um, really can quickly and will quickly turn into a housing crisis if we don't if we don't deal with the housing affordability crisis that we're living in in the first place. Um, and, and the point that you alluded to, Julia, is that it's not what we saw with the eviction, uh, the case of evictions during the pandemic, is that, you know, this is not a sort of one-to-one -one individual effect where one household gets evicted, they then become homeless, they then enter a homeless shelter and contract COVID. It, it's, that certainly happens, but it's a community level effect where, you know, because COVID is an infectious disease, and people who are evicted are our friends, our neighbors, our community members. Um, an eviction that affects one person in the community, in fact, affects all of us. Um, so um, this is a situation that can affect all of our well-being. And, and, I, and that's true in terms of health, um, also in terms of economic well-being. I, I think there's this false dichotomy between public health and economic measures where in, in the case of eviction moratoriums, they were largely instituted as um, a social support and not necessarily as a public health measure, but then it turned out to have a really dramatic public health effect um, and having less sickness and death in the population, uh, less work, less missed work due to sickness, um, and also more, more money available to spend. So, so if, if renters are not forced to dedicate 50 plus percent of their income to rent during the pandemic, that means that they can buy things like food um, and they can support businesses in their local communities. Um, so I think thinking about these things as a binary, as you know, either an economic policy or a public health policy is not actually that productive. Thank you. I really appreciate your thoughtful approach to um, thinking about housing policies and public health policies and you know, policies that can jointly improve healthy on the economy, which I think is so much of the work that we have to do going forward. Um, I see some great questions in the chat. Uh, so I'll give Kate time to review those and then come back to them during the Q&A. Uh, right now, we're going to turn over to Sarah Horsley, uh, and I'll be sharing her slides um, while she presents. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Julia. I'm Sarah Hors Horsley, she, her, and I am with BPS Families for COVID Safety. And I'm actually going to put the link to my slides in the chat. Um, and I'm going to move somewhat quickly through some of the slides just uh, for sake of time, but um, I encourage people to take a look at them at your leisure. Uh, so thanks so much, Julia, for inviting us. Um, so BPS is Boston Public Schools, and if you can advance uh, to the next slide. Um, so about a year ago, a little over a year ago, <clears throat> um, I joined together with other parents and grandparents to form this group because we were um, upset and frustrated, anxious um, with the Delta variant coming in, and yet there were fewer protections in place um, within schools. And so we started this group, Boston Public Schools, BPS Families for COVID Safety. Um, and before I go into what we've been up to, I just wanna give a little context about Boston Public Schools. Uh, we have the oldest district in the country, and so we have very old buildings, um, Julia mentioned earlier, three quarters of the buildings do not have HVAC or you know, full mechanical ventilation. In terms of demographics, we have about 46,000 students and 10,000 staff. Vast majority are students of color um, and over 70% are low income. We also have a significant proportion of children with disabilities um, who have you know, special needs in terms of learning and also English language learners. We also have many um, students who live in multi-generational households, you know, with elders and others who are have more um, 
delicate health. Um, we have a unionized workforce, and I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but uh, our vaccination rates, especially for young people and children, differ starkly by race and ethnicity. Um, so as I said, the next, if you can, the next two slides, I'm not going to talk in detail, but people can take a look um, on their own time. And there's a source, a couple of sources there, one around vaccination report for Boston, um, which they actually do break down by race, ethnicity, and neighborhood, and age. So BPS Families for COVID Safety, we are known as FAMCOSA. We're a group of families with children, grandchildren in over 50 Boston schools. And we share resources and we mobilize, we organize and advocate for improvement to COVID safety measures in our schools. That's a picture of my dad and my stepmom and my son there at a rally, one of our first rallies. Um, next slide, please. So uh, first I wanna kind of go a little bit <clears throat> by time um, in terms of, cause our advocacy has shifted as the pandemic has shifted and as different um, state and, and local policies have changed. So in the first year that we were around last school year, 21, 22, we focused really on the state level, more of our advocacy on the state level. The state's COVID policy for schools really normed the white and wealthy district in Massachusetts. Um, under Gov Governor Baker, the policy, first of all, was set by the education arm, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, even though they didn't have health expertise in-house. Um, and of course, all of this marginalized the experience of cities like Boston with majority students of color, the lower vaccination rates, and the older school buildings with worse ventilation, as I mentioned before. And so it harmed districts like ours the most. Um, second, the state insisted that families opt in to testing as opposed to saying we're going to test everyone and families can opt their kids out. They insisted that that families opt in. So that meant up to 40% of students in Boston anyway were not participating in the pool testing that the state was running. Um, then in the spring of 2022, the state pivoted to um, rapid at home testing. Um, they pivoted, I should say, from test to stay to, to sending home rapid at home tests. And that also <clears throat> uh, accentuated inequities because it put the testing burden entirely on families. Um, and to this day, we're only given one test per week, which is, as you can imagine, insufficient. Third, the state also had really rigid rules. It still does, but it was more important last year when we had the surges that we had. They had rigid rules against remote learning. And so districts like Boston, we didn't have the flexibility we really needed to go remote to control a school outbreak. Um, and so there was at least one school that had to go extra days into the spring because they chose to close to try to control the outbreak there. Um, and in fact, in January, we had high school students in BPS walking out, doing a whole walkout and media and protests because of this, because they felt so unsafe going to school during <clears throat> the Omicron surge. Then in February, right before February break, the state removed the mask requirement in schools. And um, again, this decision was based, you know, more on the suburbs with higher vaccination rates. And that was just not the case in Boston. And luckily, we're happy to say Boston kept the mask requirement uh, until June. So, so our demands, if you can go to the next slide, in this in that first year, last year, our demands, um, you know, just really briefly uh, touch all the areas that Julia mentioned, you know, masks, um, we were, you know, pushing to keep universal masking and also to provide higher quality, you know, KF94 or N95 masks, testing, keep that in place, and we were trying to get it to be opt out, um, ventilation, of course, vaccination as well, and on the state in particular, we wanted to have more flexibility for remote and also making sure that the attendance policy was fair <clears throat> because they were saying stay home if you're sick, but then at the same time of uh, punishing or threatening to punish families whose kids were missing too much school. So it was this you know, mixed messaging. And in all of our work, we also prioritize and try to center equity. So we were always um, bringing that up as well in terms of demands. If you can go to the next slide, Julia. Thanks. So a little bit about 
what we have been about, you know, what are our activities, what are our approaches, translating this energy and this desire to try to make change in policy into impact. So as I mentioned, we always prioritize equity. We also prioritize language justice. We have, you know, a lot of Spanish speaking and, and other families speaking other languages in BPS. Um, we testified at all levels between the school committee all the way up to the state at different hearings. We did email and call in campaigns. We also tried to gather a little bit of data from families, particularly about cafeterias and ventilation. We have had many, many meetings with policymakers, again, from all levels. Um, we also, you know, raised the pressure through street action, including rallies, a car caravan, um, and a lot of media outreach and media coverage. Next slide. So the next couple of slides um, just show some examples. Next slide of some of our um, work, you know, ways that we've engaged families, ways that we've raised the pressure on policymakers. So then in 2022, 2023, <clears throat> we have focused our advocacy and organizing on the city of Boston, the Boston Public Schools, and also the mayor's office, um, and also the Boston Public Health Commission. These are the three arms that kind of set the policy for Boston schools. And the reason we did that is basically because the city, excuse me, the state washed its hands of COVID, at least that's the way I see it. They don't really have any COVID mitigation measures, you know, or requirements or guidance pretty much um, for schools this year. Um, as I mentioned, they lifted the mass requirement back in February. They also completely ended all funding for pool testing. Uh, we have tried to advocate with the Healy administration, the incoming Governor Healy team, to suggest people that we think would be good um, cabinet picks. But other than that, we focused on the city. Um, so masking is now optional in Boston public schools, you know, since it was lifted in June, uh, two weeks before school ended last school year. Um, and we still have, you know, unfortunately not vaccination rates, not where we'd like them to be. Um, and also ventilation, you know, is still not uh, where it needs to be. And so not having masking, we think is a mistake. We think that, you know, it contributes to cases that we don't need to actually have. Um, BPS also has symptomatic testing and then the at-home and rapid tests. And we feel that that's insufficient. Um, and in general, BPS doesn't have a comprehensive COVID safety plan, despite um, you know many uh, recommendations we've made and many meetings with them. So the next couple of slides, if you can advance, this one just compares last year to this year in terms of what policies were in place last year, or I should say 2020, then 2021, and then 2022, 23. Um, in addition to not having universal masking or the pool in school pool PCR testing, we've struggled to get uh, the city, uh, even the Boston Public Health Commission to share with us clear metrics, especially around how do they decide that a school is having an outbreak. You know, how are they going to decide, okay, we're really at the beginning of a surge, so now we want to bring back universal masking. We're still having that discussion with them, you know, and it's like 10 weeks into the school year. The next slide, please. And then this shows, you know, we don't have a, a perfect situation in terms of gathering data, um, but given the case numbers and data that has been gathered by Boston Public Schools, the cases during the first eight weeks of school are five times higher this year than they were last year. The school district pushes back and says, well, we didn't have very good data gathering, you know, the beginning of last year either. But in any case, you know, this is really problematic and we feel that they don't have enough measures in place. Next slide, please. So these are our demands this year. Um, we are still pushing for universal masking and we're saying at least please do so you know on school buses when there's a school outbreak when a surge is beginning um and after school vacations um you know for two weeks after school vacations same thing for for testing uh bring back pool testing we're also urging them to give families more rapid tests one per week is just wholly insufficient 
We're still pushing on ventilation. You know, that's a slightly more longer term um, effort to reinvest in the schools. Uh, vaccination has been an area where there's been some progress and actually the city now has taken our suggestion to give incentives, you know, that that has been shown to encourage more people to get vaccinated. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of um, visuals and examples of some of the press coverage that we've been able to get and some of the pushing we've been doing this year in terms of uh, pushing them to have a better COVID plan and have more practices in place. Um, we did an open letter that we got signed by over a dozen groups, health groups, uh, education groups, others. Um, and we had a press conference on the first day of school. There's my co-founder of FAMCOSA Suleika um, talking to the press and some other parents uh, who had been, you know, in particular imp impacted by uh, the lifting of the mask mandate, for example. And um, then <clears throat> many of you probably know that the Boston Public Health Commission uh, was, or several of their staff were co-authors of a study that was recently released in the New England Journal of Medicine showing the effectiveness of universal masking. And so we, uh, when that was released, again, did a press release and, and got some media coverage saying, you know, masking works, you know, why are we not basing this, basing our policy on evidence, you know, and on equity here? Uh, so just a little bit more about our organizing and, and how we work. Um, we focus on leadership development, engaging families and also allies. We balance what we call inside strategy and outside strategy. So inside being meeting with policymakers, communicating with policymakers, outside strategy being raising the pressure on those decision makers through a lot of different um, tactics that I've spoken about in terms of rallies and media coverage and so forth. Um, and there's some lists there of some of the partners and decision makers that we work with. And next slide, please, that shows an even more comprehensive list of some of the allies we've worked with, including people like Julia, you know, public health experts and researchers, um, groups that focus on occupational safety and health, so mass cost around ventilation, uh, educators, the nurses, the BPS nurses, they're part of the Boston Teachers Union, um, and then a lot of different family groups, also the Boston Climate Action Network, you know, is interested in ventilation as well. Uh, next slide, that just gives a little bit more information about the student walkout. And next slide, a little bit about our wins. Um, early on between the Boston Teachers Union and families, we pushed BPS to get HEPA air cleaners for every classroom and also more funding for COVID safety. Um, as we mentioned in last year, the mask requirements stayed in place and prevented you know, thousands of COVID cases. And then this year, as I mentioned, the incentives for the vaccine clinics. Um, next slide. So um, I'll just briefly go through these, but these were some of the questions that Julia had raised, you know, how do we translate energy and desire to influence policy into impact? I mentioned the inside and outside strategy, being creative to engage the families that are most impacted, coalition and allies, that's so important to leverage our power, many voices, as Julia was saying. We've really had to be relentless, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of meetings and, and figure out ways to raise the pressure on those decision makers when they just keep saying the same thing over and over. And then it's been really wonderful and also important, I think, to you know just support each other in doing the work um, and build those relationships with each other. Um, next slide. Um, and then in terms of thinking about how do we um, operate, especially in this context, of um, policymakers, you know, having so many different <clears throat> stakeholders um, pressuring them from different sides, and how do we, as we would say, hold policymakers accountable to lead based on evidence, science, data, and equity? Um, one is that we 
in terms of our analysis and our developing of our demands, we do it collectively and we balance, you know, we're drawing both on expertise that we have in our group and, and allies around public health, around ventilation and so forth with the lived experience of BPS families and especially those who've been most impacted by COVID and most marginalized. Um, in terms of tactics, you know, we, we do raise the pressure and we do have, you know, sort of street heat protests and so forth, but in a respectful way, not in a bullying way, um, the way that anti-vax and anti-mask folks have been, especially against Mayor Wu. Um, I mentioned coalition and allies. And then the last thing I'll just say is, you know, we keep trying to, to say to policymakers you know, you need to listen to those most impacted uh, black and brown families, low income families, um, people with special health and educational needs and craft the policy based on them, not on, you know, others who may be loud um, and showing up at your house and so forth, um, and not on the wealthier white residents or districts. So I will wrap it up there. Um, we welcome you know, folks who aren't Boston Public Schools families to, you know, stay abreast of what we're up to. And I'll just put in the chat, we have a, a sign up sheet, you can sign up and get, you know, on our listserv and so forth. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. And um, thank you for your work. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for answering those questions uh, in your presentation. You know, I think um, really, um, uh, fantastic guidance on how people can get involved here and, and in their communities um, and, and build coalitions, you know, regionally as well. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of interest in this and a lot of need to, um, for this kind of work to help achieve that middle ground. Um, with that, I want to make sure we have time for John's presentation. So, um, so thank you so much, Sarah and Kate, for your fantastic presentations. Uh, John, we'll turn over to you um, to hear about physical distancing policies and inequities. Thanks so much. Um, sorry, I'm having some monitor issues here. Um, so um, I, I'm sort of taken back to when I started this work as um, a little bit of a sideline for my normal research on uh, the social epidemiology of community gun violence. Um, this was uh, late uh, March 2020. Um, I had gotten sick with something. I had a fever for um, almost two weeks. And so kind of intermittently between um, lying on the floor of the living room where I was isolating um, in a one bedroom apartment, uh, I was getting into data sources that we could use to understand what was going on in those early days of the pandemic. Um, and so that experience was uncomfortable, but um, also highlights the way that I was able to do my job from home. Uh, so the first study that came out of this work uh, was focused on neighborhood income and physical distancing. And so we had data on all census block groups uh, in the US. So that's uh, over 200,000 uh, so kind of micro neighborhoods. Uh, and these data were looking at January through May of 2020. Uh, this was the few months around um, the start of the, um, the period when uh, daily life was really changing on a large scale across the U.S. So um, in particular, the, um, the factor that we were looking at was neighborhood income quintile. So at the neighborhood level, what was the um, median income? And we analyzed this uh, across states and on a, uh, with a measure uh, uh, for every day. The outcomes we were looking at was mobility, this is from uh, smartphone data uh, collected by a, a company called SafeGraph. I used to have to spend a lot of time explaining what these data were and where they came from, what they mean, but I think this has become more familiar uh, over the last couple of years. Um, there's lots of uh, interesting and important ethical questions around where these data come from, what they mean, 
Um, but this was, uh, this did allow us to, to answer some questions that were uh, um, uh, quite important around the, the, the influence of policies. So the outcomes that we were looking at at the neighborhood income quintile level by day and state were days spent entirely at home, days when someone goes to work, meaning they sort of leave their inferred home address and um, stay somewhere during the day for, uh, I believe, up to eight hours or, or, or uh, close to eight hours. Um, and then visits to other locations like supermarkets and parks. Uh, you'll see those data in just a moment. And what we were particularly interested in in the study was the impact of state policies. Um, and we this was um, an early use of the CUSP database um, and I think really evidence of just how important it was what Dr. Raifman and colleagues, uh, including some of my research assistants, were able to stand up so quickly uh, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, to understand what was happening with, with physical distancing and other state level policies. So we analyzed the changes in mobility and we wanted to know whether state policies, particularly stay at home orders, um, increase physical distancing and whether those um, uh, effects might vary across neighborhood income levels. So um, this was uh, the finding on how, how days at home, days spent entirely at home uh, changed um, uh, on a weekly, uh, sorry, uh, a, week, a weekly basis uh, from January to May uh, in 2020. And so what we see is that before that inflection point, um, people living in neighborhoods at um, the lowest income levels spent the most days entirely at home. They were least, uh, they were least mobile. After that inflection point in mid-March, uh, people living in those lowest income neighborhoods were the most mobile. Their days at home increased, but it increased less than people in higher income categories. And so we see an 11% increase after that inflection point in the lowest income neighborhoods versus a 27% increase in the highest neighborhoods. These are all um, percentage points uh, looking at the um, a scale of, of what percent of people uh, were staying home all day. And so the question was, was this because people are voluntarily um, social distancing uh, for their health at higher income levels? Uh, or are there, what are the drivers of this? And so what we see is really uh, the, the inverse gradient uh, in patterns of working, uh, days spent at work. So um, can this pattern suggests that those disparities in physical distancing that we saw uh, by income level can be explained at least in part by the need to go to work because people at the lowest income levels before the pandemic, they were um, least likely to be at, uh, at work during the day. And then after this pandemic inflection point, they're most likely to be at work. Uh, but we wondered if there might be other trips, other sort of voluntary trips that explain some of that income disparity. What we found was that such a, a, a difference in those behaviors did not exist. So it was not the case that people living in lower income neighborhoods were more likely to run to the convenience store, uh, spend time in a park, run to a liquor store compared to people at higher income levels. We found one tiny difference, which was uh, visits to places of worship. But that in a, in a secondary analysis, we found that was not um, based on um, visits on the weekends when we might expect people to be going to um, services, but rather during weekdays. And so we guess that that might have to do with places of worship being used to um, uh, as service delivery points. Um, uh, one of the earlier panelists, uh, Dr. Leifheit, uh, explained the event study. Uh, so uh, we use that event study framework to see how policy affects those uh, stay-at-home orders affected these uh, days at home outcomes uh, across income quintiles. 
And so what we see, so we see that increasing pre-trend, which you mentioned, which suggests that people were already trying to stay home more. And we do see an effect, it's biggest in the highest income quintile, but even in that quintile, it's a relatively small effect. So uh, the biggest effect that we found was um, 3.2 percentage point increase. And this is in the context of a group that had a 27 percentage point increase during the same time. So at best, policy effects were modest. They, uh, people were already uh, staying at home. The orders only slightly increased those behaviors. So as I said, physical distancing inverted the association between income and daily mobility. Uh, those physical distancing changes early in the pandemic, uh, they were explained by differences in working outside of the home rather than trips to other common locations. And policies, state policies were not the main driver of changes in mobility. Uh, we did some follow-up work on use of public spaces, so specifically parks. We do see park visits rebounding uh, in the summer of 2020 much faster than other types of visits, like to uh, gyms or transit stations. Park visits rebound much more. But that rebound was biggest uh, in visits to parks that served the most privileged areas. So if a park was in a if the service area of a park, meaning the 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 area where people can easily walk to that park within 10 minutes. If it served a population that was predominantly white and high income, there was a larger rebound in the summer and fall of 2020. I also just want to flag that uh, some of the other health uh, crises that we've seen uh, since the pandemic, uh, there was an unprecedented increase in firearm homicides from 2019 to 2020. Um, uh, a paper was recently published finding that in the first year of the pandemic, um, child firearm deaths, um, the increase alone associated with the pandemic was comparable to the number of children who died from COVID itself. Uh, that's not to minimize the number of children who died from COVID, but to illustrate the magnitude of this um, uh, uh, gun homicide, uh, uh, gun violence uh, crisis among children. Um, work from my lab has found first that um, in Boston, uh, the increase in gun violence has disproportionately affected Black and Latinx victims, that nationally, the increase has disproportionately affected neighborhoods where Black children live and other children of color, with the increase the smallest in neighborhoods where white children live. And uh, going back to that spike in gun victimization, we found across four major U.S. cities that that spike uh, in child gun victimization has comprised 99% children of color. So the growing proportion of children of color being victimized uh, 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 explains almost all of the spike in gun violence since the start of the pandemic. So it's been great to be here with you all. I I'm excited to, to talk more about these, these trends. Thank you. Thanks for, for such a thoughtful presentation here. And I'll uh, come back on camera as well. I uh, really, really grateful to everyone uh, for being here for great questions um, and for everyone for taking the time and to our panelists. Um, I, John, I'm, I, I'm really interested to hear from you. You know, I think you highlight several of the costs of like all of the disruption that happened during the pandemic and how it's going to have high, high costs no matter what. Um, you know, and I think it's um, it's really interesting to see pretty simplistic depictions of the period that you're talking about um, or, or that your research focused on where um, we've heard, you know, all this anti-lockdown um, kind of rhetoric about this very early, brief, relatively brief period of the pandemic, um, you know, that, that was a really striking shared experience, but it was also a, a time, the pandemic forces us to grapple with impossible, really unpleasant costs, no matter what, um, you know, those costs need to be um, either, a, you know, much higher risk of death and disease and, and death that lasts forever, right, relative to like a brief period of economic hardship that actually could be mitigated by policies and was largely mitigated by policies. Now, it took time for that to happen, the stress levels, you know, the data on mental distress were through the roof during that period for everyone as we face this new threat and so much uncertainty, um, you know, and so I think I think it is this collective, like really traumatic, costly experience, and now it's playing out 
you know, also in gun violence, also there's this long legacy of um, of this trauma and its ramifications um, and of, the, you know, just societal upheaval. Um, and I think so much of how we can get through that together is by coming together to support one another, to um, to kind of have this period of reflection of facing what has happened and, um, you know, trauma informed teaching and trauma informed, um, I, you know, just public services. <laughs> um, and I wonder what you're seeing in that space and if you have any hope for, um, for movement to kind of come together about uh, to address um, the continued costs and legacy of, of that early period. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you said. I think the um, there's it's clear that some of the most important services um, that prevent violence um, and um, keep young people safe were hung up during the pandemic. And I'm, I'm not referring to policing, which does not have strong evidence as a violence prevention intervention, uh, but to um, community-based services that young people need. And so I think. But that doesn't mean just the um, our policies have not been consistently designed around addressing the needs of the most vulnerable people. I mean, arguably the opposite. And so I think the um, as you say, the um, there's this talk about balancing costs. But I think we need to be more explicit and more equitable about cost to whom and uh, what are the measures that uh, that will achieve the, the most important goals. Yeah, thank you. And, I, and I'm curious for um, for our panelists who are in academia. Um, you know, how do you see um, academia kind of situated in this space? You know, and I think um, and I think it's an important time for kind of a coming together of conversations. We had a lot of discourse about anti-racism in the world, in policies and in academia in 2020. And I think, and, a lot, and that was a very important conversation. We learned a lot and in a lot of ways, um, we actually had a really rich discussion on anti-racism in academia, continuing the conversation at the Boston University School of Public Health earlier this semester. And everyone's reflections were really that we haven't um, fulfilled a lot of the promises and, and aspirations of that period um, and have actually started to see some setbacks um, that then, you know, also consolidate like the privilege and power aspects of academia and the homogeneity um, of a predominantly like white and um, uh, population that that has um, a little participation from underrepresented minor, uh, or little opportunity for people who are from underrepresented groups. Um, and so I wonder, you know, how you see, we see these spaces as interconnected and going forward, um, how can, um, how can we continue that work within academia and in the policy space more broadly? It's a good question. I don't know if I'll have a complete answer, but I I do think the pandemic has has sort of shined a light on a lot of things, one of which is that sort of our incentives as academics and public health practitioners are not always aligned with the the outcomes that we want and sort of our our charge as as folks in public health. So I, I think it a lot of us have faced challenges both within our institutions and from sort of a funding level to, to, to get this work done and to actually do work that advances um, social and racial health equity. Um, I have seen, you know, certain foundations and to some extent the NIH put out calls for research that, that you know, starts to, to delve into um, you know, the kinds of questions we're answering today about how do we plan for a more equitable future and uh, and prepare for a pandemic, but um, I think not not nearly enough. And the idea is that we need protective time and, and money and, and, you know, resources to not only fund ourselves, but give back to community and prop up um, the folks that are doing this work on the ground. Yeah, I, I think that's really important and and actually like looking at a Boston Globe story today and like a study that was affected by industry influence, I think it's also important to realize that like 
um, in a um, in a, a soft money environment, which is what public health runs on, which is that we have to bring in grants and and funding to do our our research um, and to cover our job our time and our jobs. Um, sometimes the groups that have that money are the same groups that are you know funding. Um, anti-COVID mitigation measures um, or um, disrupting public education um, and the anti-critical race theory work, the anti-LGBTQ um, rights work. Uh, and I, so I think that's important for journalists to recognize. Now also, <laughs> there, there's another group that's being funded by those same groups, which are journalists. So, um, you know, so I think it's important for the public to be aware of this, um, for everyone to be aware of it, and, and to also know that within these constraints, there's still a lot that we can do, and, and a lot of that is coming together, collaborating, organizing, being really purposeful about how we approach our research and our work, and, um, and, and you know, a lot of volunteer time goes into a lot of this too, right, to take those meetings with policymakers, to have those rallies, Um I uh, and um, and I know that I know <laughs> I know that everybody who produced those 160 plus publications was not working 40 hours a week um, as they were, um, you know, often home with kids and, and trying to help. Um, I know our volunteers were full time students and and also really working to help. So, you know, that's that's the spirit. It's certainly challenging. It's certainly challenging three years into this. Um, I, you know, but I, I think the spirit, the organization and collaboration and, and cohesion is, is how we overcome a lot of these challenges. All right, just to turn to some of the questions in the chat here. Um, uh, there's a question about looking into local public health interventions that reduce the number of evictions or interrupted COVID transmission among people experiencing homelessness. I think that probably is best for Kate. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I'm in LA and um, I think one promising intervention that, that we did here was, you know, hotels weren't getting used during the pandemic by and large. So the, the LA County Health Department took them over and made places for people to isolate and quarantine if they were experiencing homelessness or didn't have space to quarantine and isolate at home. Um, it's called Project Room Key in LA. I, I know other cities did similar things. Um, it seems like a promising model. I, I think it was hard to, you know, get the money, make the rooms available. I, I think the logistics of it were tricky, but um, I think it the 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 idea behind it was good. Um, I visited a couple of those ha those sites during um, 2021, and the folks that were staying there seemed really happy with the services they were receiving. Um, more globally, in terms of reducing evictions. Um, moratoria were certainly effective you know there were some strong a lot of the local moratoria were actually stronger than the state ones um and then in more recent times there's you know there was emergency rental assistance those funds are sort of running out now but that's an important measure to prevent evictions and help folks settle up their debts with landlords um and then there are sort of a national right to counsel movement to um, make sure we're providing lawyers to people that are facing eviction so that they can defend their rights in eviction court. I th thank you. I do see it's 1.30, so I know some of our panelists have to go. I really want to thank you so much um, for uh, to everyone for being here. Um, there are some other great questions in the chat, so if panelists are available to stay, it will take um, maybe one or two more. We'll do one more question, and then, uh, and then I'll just ask you to share some closing words. Um, uh, I, but anyone who has to leave. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. did, okay. John, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah, well, I have to leave, but thank you so much. It's been great being here with you all. Thank you. I just wanted to add um, on what uh, Kate had started and in answer, I think, to the second question that was in the, the Q&A, because I actually work have worked in the housing space as well. Um, in Boston, there's some great um, uh, grassroots groups and, and nonprofits who've been working for years, actually, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in terms of taking housing off the, the market, you know, so approaches such as uh, land trusts and um, co-ops, uh, low, low, what do they call it? Limited equity co-ops. So uh, in other words, trying to make sure that there's a, you know, another option for creating more affordable housing that is just not in the capitalist market so that it doesn't have subject to the same pressures of, you know, speculation and all the other problems that we have. 
Yeah, and I think that was the other question I was going to share is just this this question about like structural solutions um, and the idea that um, that a lot of international real estate investors, um, Airbnb, like these are um, these are straining um, housing. And do you have uh, have you seen particularly promising strategies or maybe resources we can share an answer to that those chats? Um, oh, and let me see if I can share the slide link as an answer to the chat. <laughs> Um, uh, here so that you have that, um, I, but, uh, because somebody is asking about the slide link, um, but, um, but yeah, I have, I, for, for our other panelists, do you have suggestions about structural solutions to the housing crisis? Um, it's a big question. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think the, um, the the person is right that you know just creating more housing supply won't work if we don't create a more just you know housing system and more just society um and i did want to flag that um in dr raifman's opening remarks she kind of talked about the influence of dark money in the school debate but it's also um you know the major force funding all of these lawsuits against the federal eviction moratorium was these big corporate developers. Um, so, you know, they, they they did it sort of under the guise of, you know, the small landlord, but, you know, landlords were really needed relief through emergency rental assistance this whole time. Um, so fighting the eviction moratorium clearly isn't a fight that served them, um, but it definitely allowed corporate landlords to accumulate, you know, a massive market share and buy up distressed properties during this crisis, just as they did during the 2008 housing crisis. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, maybe we can do some closing words uh, <laughs> on a hopeful note. <laughs> um, I, so let's see, maybe I will start with Sarah. Um, uh, what, any closing recommendations for people who want to get involved in organizing um, uh, and in their communities and meetings with policymakers? Um, I think, you know, just depending on where you are, you know, just reach out to your other people uh, in your similar situation, reach out to allies. Um, we, several of us were upset and we just started, you know, who else is concerned about this and just like started meeting, started sharing ideas and kind of built a group from there. So I think Julia is really right that we are all people. We all have a role to play in, you know, holding those that are in, in office accountable and, and influencing policy. Um, and if you join together with other people, you're gonna have your voices gonna be stronger and you'll find other groups that share, you know, concerns and, and demands and be able to um, hopefully make a difference that way. Kate, any closing words? No, I think we should end on that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I think every, I completely agree. You know, I think everyone should see themselves as having the capacity to lead wherever they are, whatever community they're in, whatever position they're in, whatever expertise they bring, including lived experience, which is a really important and under addressed domain of expertise. You know, reach out to your journalists, reach out to your policymakers and share your stories. Um, share um, share what's important to you um, and come together with others to um, to really speak to your communities and the evidence. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in this conversation, for your wonderful questions. I am glad to be in touch if it's helpful as everyone continues this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.